Welcome. This is a purpose-driven innovation ecosystem and today we are starting a new series called Purpose-Driven Future Leaders. We are here at the Meiji Shrine, Meiji Jingu. And it's a special occasion because this year, 2020, it's the centennial anniversary of the Meiji Shrine. 130 years ago, a revolutionary man, the Meiji Tenno, already reformed the education system and also put forward the Five O's Charter, which was the first constitution in Asia. We start this series with my good friend, Patrick Newell. I'm very honored to have him here. He's the founder of the Impact 21 Foundation. He brought TED Talks to Tokyo. He is the founder of the Tokyo International School. He brought Singularity to Tokyo. And now he's a professor at Shizenkan University. He calls himself a 21st century educator. So that's another reason why we are here at the Meiji Shrine, uh, this place of the reformation of education. And I introduce to you Patrick Newell and our interview host, Yuichi Terada. Yuichi Terada is my partner in the Purpose Driven Innovation Ecosystem, and he will lead the interview. Hello, everyone. I'm Yuichi Terada. I'm the partner to PDIE, Purpose Driven Innovation Ecosystem, and I will be interviewing today Patrick Newell. So, thank you. Good morning, Patrick. Oh, good morning. How are you today? Feeling great. Okay. We actually got this opportunity to film at the Major Shrine because of Patrick. Patrick comes here every morning to pay respect to the Shrine, and therefore we got this opportunity, so thank you again. Oh, no, it's my pleasure. Thanks for coming to Major Shrine. It's a very special place. And what makes you feel so special about Meiji Shrine? Meiji Shrine is a really special place. Um, I, I like to come here regularly because it's nature right in the middle of Tokyo. It honors the Meiji Emperor, but not just the Meiji Emperor, but the period of time, the Meiji period, where there was major transformation in Japan. You have a very good point. This Meiji Shrine and the Meiji era is rather symbolic because the Meiji era is what really brought new reform to Japan. And that's exactly what we need today for after COVID. What I say a lot is actually, we are in the kind of the Shin Edo period. People can't come, people can't go, things are very isolated. And soon we will enter the Shin Meiji period or Jidai. Mm. And so very interesting to see how Japan reshapes itself in this, in this kind of new future. Yes, very good point. Yeah, many people often talk about Japan and the age of uh, isolation. So you're right. Um, I think we were all isolated in a sense, but now we are realizing the importance of how we need to be connected. And it's also very interesting that we're on a bridge, right? Yes, the concept of bridge. Yeah. The, uh, I think especially as foreigners in Japan, that we are, or, and also people like yourself who are bilingual, have lived overseas, mm -hmm. are very much important bridges for the future of Japan and bringing together very traditional Japan and some of the people, the older people in Japan with the new Japan and, um, and being a bridge for that. Very good, yeah. You're talking about not only people, but bridging generation, um, gender, age, what have you, diversity and inclusion. Absolutely. So Patrick, have you always known your purpose of life? Wow, that's a great question. I guess when we're young, we realize in a way our purpose in life is to be educated, to go to school, because that we have to do. Mm -hmm. And then we leave school and my kind of purpose was to make money. I wanted to be rich. I wanted to accumulate a lot of money. But then I realized that that purpose wasn't enough and I wanted to have a deeper purpose. Mm -hmm. And so I traveled around the world for a year and realized how special Asia is. And then I realized how special Japan was and that really my purpose was to be a bridge between the rest of the world or the West and Japan and try to synchronize things together with Japan because most Japanese people do not speak English. They've not lived overseas and they really rely on Japanese media to tell them what the world is like. 
And so I feel like my purpose in many ways is to share with Japan and Japanese people how special Japan is and how special Japan is in regards to the rest of the world. Ah, very well. Thank you. That actually brings us to a very good topic. This is a book that Patrick wrote, and it's Nihon ga Sekai Ichi o Mamori no Kusenryaku. I read this book, and I really like this book because, um, first of all, it gives you a vision of the 2030, uh, about a future vision. The other thing that I really liked as Japanese is that it really encouraged me, and it also gave me a kind of strength. Uh, a belief in Japan and also who we are and sort of the virtues that we have. Uh, what was your intention of this title? Because I really like the title very much actually. The title is really provocative and most Japanese people do not think Japan is number one. And many people in the world now there's Japan passing. But I found a lot of research that actually shows Japan is the number one country in the world in many different areas. According to the U.S. World News, Japan is number one. According to Future Brands, Japan is number one. According to Michelin Stars, Japan is number one. Most Michelin Stars in the world. Safest city is Tokyo, largest city. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. But the real reason was that most Japanese people do not have confidence in Japan because of Japan passing and the feeling that Japan is just going downward because most Japanese people don't speak English and they don't have not lived overseas and they just rely on the Japanese media and so it's a very narrow perspective so I wanted Japanese people to realize how amazing Japan really is and how it can be a role model for the rest of the world and how it can bridge between Asia and the West because coming and moving forward Asia is going to be the future and Japan can be the center of that future Okay, Patrick, I would like to ask you another question. So, since we are a purpose-driven innovation ecosystem, I would like to ask what your purpose in life is. Who? <laughs> One of the deepest questions you can ask somebody. Maybe I would start with, one of my favorite quotes is, the purpose of life is a life of purpose. And I think, unfortunately, many of us are not feeling like we're living a life of purpose. We're kind of, uh, you know, going through the steps of life. Mm -hmm. So, for example, when we're young, we go to school and it's required. So is it really our purpose in life? Well, in some ways it is a purpose in life, but it's something we have to do because that's what we're told to do, right? Mm -hmm. Then we leave school and we're told we have to get a job, we have to be responsible and we have to make money. So our purpose may be more money driven or to kind of safety driven to, to provide for our needs kind of thing, right? And so I think I fell very much into that kind of category. And I was trying to, and I really didn't like school at all. I thought it was ridiculous and a waste of time and didn't really have a deep sense of purpose. And then I was very much chasing money and I was working actually at Beverly Hills Bank, feeling like so empty inside, like mm -hmm. a lack of purpose. Mm -hmm. And so I did some soul searching and I traveled around the world and I arrived in India and spent three months in India and was just amazed at how different and the purpose, how different the purpose was and how people were, the focus that they had in India. And I spent three months there and I realized that I need to become much more balanced in my perspective, in my mindset, to be less Western and more Asian. So I made a commitment to move to Asia and I decided Japan in Tokyo at the time. And so I moved to Japan, but I just didn't know what my purpose was. I knew it was to become a better person and to serve in some way, but I didn't really know what my purpose was. And then wonderfully, uh, I met a Japanese lady and we had children and we decided to start a school for our children. And I can't think of almost a much deeper purpose than creating an education program for your own children. And so we started Tokyo International School in 1995 with 12 children in two small rooms, but with a very strong purpose, real purpose-driven um, focus. And Tokyo International School built up and built up, and then all of a sudden, people from around the world were saying, what's going on here at Tokyo International School? We want to learn. So the purpose went from serving the children of Tokyo International School, actually serving children around the world. And, and in Japan, we had so many Kyoiko Inkais visit us. And so it was extraordinary. And then I 
had the honor and opportunity of going to TED, the TED Talks. And I came back and I was just like, Japan really needs something like this. And together with the co-founder, Tom Porter, who um, is part of this uh, ecosystem as well, and we decided to start TEDx Tokyo. And the main reason was because Japan has so many amazing ideas, but they're not shared around the world. And Japanese people are shy about presenting and sharing their ideas. And so we launched TEDx Tokyo, the second TEDx in the world. And so we became part of this global purpose driven movement called TEDx. And so that deepened my kind of feeling of purpose and serving many people. And more recently, I got very involved in uh, Singularity University, which is a think tank in Silicon Valley. And the whole focus of Singularity University is to share the exponential technologies and how they're converging together mm -hmm. to create a, a exponential, an exponential curve of change in the next 10 years like we've never seen in the history of the world through these technologies. And I went to Singularity University, I came back and I looked at Japan and I said, there's all these amazing, huge Japanese companies with lots of money and resources mm -hmm wasting money in R&D and business development, not knowing what to do or how to reinvent themselves. So thought Singularity University would be a great way to do that. And so the next purpose became using technology and the kind of gaiatsu, the pressure from the outside to push Japan to really embrace the change that's happening in the world and this exponential curve to move Japan forward. So there's been a lot of different shifts kind of in my purpose, but they've all been really about kind of through education or serving other people and serving the, the, the greater. Thank you. You mentioned about technology. So there's so much talk about technology and how, you know, our personal information is what stolen and where does it go and things like that. Is technology a very good thing? You talk about singularity, technology. Tell me a little bit about that. Hmm. Yeah, one of the, I think, real challenges, especially at Singularity University, was there's such a focus on how the technology can improve our lives. But how much good is it really doing? At, at Shizenkan University, I teach a, a course about the future. And one of the sessions is about ethics mm. and AI ethics or the ethics of using technology to enhance our bodies or using technology in ways of tracking people, using technologies in really harmful ways. And, you know, I've watched some social media kind of Netflix shows and things like that that shows the power of technology can really, really be um, de detrimental. Mm -hmm. I mean, some people say Brexit and the Trump elections would have never happened if it wasn't for social media and the power of technology kind of thing. So that's one way of maybe using it in a less than positive way. Depends on how you look at it, I guess, right? And so I've been focusing a lot on a concept called one plus one equals 11, right? So we have human and nature, right? Plus technology together, the one plus one equals 11. Creative collective intelligence. So how can we use the combination of the two to bring together all of the intelligences collectively to make a better world? Mm -hmm. What I call creative collective intelligence, right? And so singularity concept is that machine intelligence is gonna become stronger, more intelligent than, than human intelligence. Well, how do we find that synergy between the one plus one equals 11? Everything has a dark side, everything has a light side. And depending on how we focus our energy, or how we harness that, we can go in a very positive way and use technology for good and to make a difference in the world and society. And so when I think about technology, I think about it, how can it make the world a better place? How can it cut down hunger and poverty? There's three billion people that are they're either obese or mal malnutritioned, right? So it's a very, very powerful tool. How we use that tool really is going to be interesting moving forward. So, Patrick, you mentioned about silos. Silo is definitely one of the biggest challenges in Japan, but what are some of the other challenges mm. that we face? 
Yeah, so just talk a little bit about silos, mm -hmm. right? For some reason, you know, Japan is like, Ishini, gambari masho, we're gonna do it together. But it's probably one of the most siloed times in history right now in Japan. People are really working individually or companies are not are working individually. So one of the biggest challenges is that our people are not working together. They're not taking the collective intelligence and really working together. And so, for example, there's many different companies in Japan. Imagine if they gathered together and shared the intellectual um, property. They have the IPs. There's so much intellectual property. I call say, uh, I say sitting in the prison, the mm -hmm. intellectual property prison. They're not being used. There's all these patents, but they're not really being used. So. One of the key things I think challenges is taking these patents and, and these different companies coming together and really as one. Because as individual companies, almost none of the companies in Japan are in the top 100 in the world. So if you're, if you're not by yourself able to do it, you need to do it collectively, right? So one of the biggest challenges is silos. The other is mindset. Um, there's a whole generation of people in their 50s and 60s right now who you know went to the good college right got into the good company did everything they were supposed to do got the escalator ride up to becoming the bucho or kacho or shacho and now the world is just going whoa exponential change and they don't know what to do they don't know how to change with it they don't have the skill set for that so there's a there's a lot of middle managers i call them it's kind of shit today but i call them jama no oji-san like they're, they're the kind of old men who get in the way and it's not intentional. It just happens to be this period of time. So another big challenge is um, these, these upper management people kind of allowing for the younger generations to come to do things and take risks and try things and create an environment for them to be able to try new things. The other thing that's really interesting is Society 5.0. So right now the government's decided that we really need to go back to a purpose-driven businesses. And so almost all of the corporations in Japan were founded to make the world a better place, to make Japan a better place, to make the difference in our lives. Most of their mission statements, most of their slogans are about doing something for humanity. But they're, they're being driven right now by numbers. It's a number-driven situation. And so how do we shift that to more of a purpose-driven, society-driven? So using technology together with these ideas to make a difference in the world has a huge impact. So if you look at where Japan is leading in the world right now, which is in many different areas, or can lead in the world, if that was spread to the rest of the world, and that's why Japan's economy grew so much is because it actually sold its products to the world kind of thing. And so one of the biggest challenges is kind of is re starting to sell Japanese products more around the world as well as take ideas from around the world to solve the solutions, make them better, as Japan does so well, and then resell them to the rest of the world. That makes perfect sense. Wow. Very good. And how do you see Japanese leadership? There's a lot of very strong leaders in this country, but most people don't believe that. And the way the society works is when it's necessary, these people will rise up and they will lead. But otherwise, everybody wants to keep harmonious, right? Keep without any waves, just keep things in the most harmonious way. But if something really happens, these people will rise up and we will see leaders. So there's many leaders in Japan. They're just not exhibiting the leadership that we expect in the West, which is to be the individual leader versus the collective leader in a collective society. And so when you talk about leadership, are you talking about leadership in the eyes of the Westerner, in the eyes of the Harvard Business School, in the eyes of European? Or are we talking about leadership in the eyes of, from an Asian perspective, yeah. or more of a collectivist perspective, right? So there's a lot of different ways to lead. You can lead by example. I think Japan leads by example in many ways, and other people are so amazed by how Japanese people live or how they treat each other. And so I think there's a lot of leading by example in many ways in Japan. The other thing that people criticize is Japanese people never make decisions, right? Well, by not making a decision, in some ways you're making a decision. 
right? You're letting the, the harmony or letting things just happen naturally. And that will be the end result without trying to push something to be something maybe it isn't. So it's a balance between, as a leader, having a vision and saying, let's go together and saying, okay, let's see how things go. Right, and I think that's, as a leader, you need to find that balance between the two. Nice. And um, so talking about leadership and then making change of purpose, how do you think innovation will happen in Japan? The, there's, a, there's a lot of innovation in Japan, mm. a lot of innovation. And it's just hiding, I think, in many ways. But the biggest challenge, I think, is people are afraid to make mistakes. So one of the aha moments for me was, how come there's not more Japanese software companies, mm. right? And the reason why is that people are afraid to not make something perfect. So software naturally in the beginning is not perfect. You know from the beginning it's something that's not perfect, that's gonna be improved and improved and improved. That just doesn't work with the Japanese mindset. The other thing that's interesting is this concept of prototyping. So you said challenges. Japanese people read everything, they have so much information. They kind of know what to do, but they don't know how to do it or how to prototype something because the way the system works in Japan is when you have the perfect product, then you sell it and people will buy kind of thing. In many other places in the world, it's let's make something, share it, get feedback, bring it back, make it better, share it, prototype, 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 and then we sell the product. So I think there's a gap there as well and, and just feeling free to make and create, make mistakes and share the imperfect, and then move forward. Today you mentioned about education, leadership, innovation. How do you envision your future in 2030? My future? I really hope that I just continue to... I really feel very grateful. And I feel very grateful because of opportunities like this, the opportunity to be able to share with a larger audience kind of the purpose and how I see purpose and how we all really need to have a purpose. So for me, I just hope to be able to share whether it's me directly. And I think actually one of the most powerful ways of giving is to give without people knowing who gave. So I want to continue to be able to do things and make things and create things where people don't even know I was part of it but somehow it became this movement that helped shift and improve the lives of many. And the beautiful thing about education is that you have the opportunity to kind of plant seeds and ideas or even disrupt in some ways people's perspectives. And a great example of that is I'm teaching a lesson tonight at Shizenkan about design. And some of the Japanese students from the, the class, the last class said, well, why are you teaching us all these things about beautiful design and thirds and colors and fonts and weight and all of these things when I will never use this in my Japanese company? Because we have tons of things on slides, tons of text, and it's just not what you're sharing and what we're doing is so far apart. To me, that's the beauty of education. If you can show somebody something that, that they haven't seen before that is really different, but makes sense, then you're moving them in the direction towards that change and, and disrupting that change kind of thing. So for me, if I can continue being able to share my ideas with children younger ages or create frameworks upon which will impact many people, that's amazing because the purpose of life is a life of purpose and we're all here to serve. And so I'm doing my best with what I've been given as my superpowers, my strengths, to serve Japan and, and whoever is, is, is willing to be part of what I'm doing. Patrick, in your book, you talk about the future in 2030. Is there a message that you would like to convey to our audience um, in order to make a better 2030? Mm. In the book, I have five questions, right? And the first question is to get people to think about what do they think they're, what's Japan gonna be like in 2030? What's their vision of Japan in 2030? 
Then the next question I ask them is like, describe your 24 hour day in 2030, right? So what happens is people kind of project where they think Japan's gonna be and where they're gonna be. But what's amazing is there's a huge gap. There's a huge gap between where they think they're gonna be in 10 years, where Japan's gonna be in 10 years, and where we are now. So the next thing is like, okay, there's this huge gap. What challenges are we gonna face in order to reach that vision that they have, right? And then you, you frame those challenges and then you say, okay, well, how, how can we use technology or what can we do to solve those challenges, right? And often technology is a powerful way to do that. And also staying in our heart, the human side is really important, right? So then it's like, okay, you've done all that. And now it's like, well, well what can you do now? What plan can you make and start now to making that 2030 the reality that you want it to be? I think that's really important. The other thing is the world is changing so fast. We have to reskill, re-educate ourselves. Most people don't understand what the future skills are, and most of them are soft skills, or really understand different technologies. They've heard about things, but they don't really know about them. But 10 years ago, nobody was an expert in most of these technologies. So if you focused on a particular technology or an area that you had interest in, and went deep in that, you could become one of the leading experts in the world, just like those who are today. So re-educate yourself, understand your strengths and your purpose and how you can contribute, put that together with that vision you have for the future with a plan, and often plans change, but as long as you have that clear vision of where you want to go, you can reach it. And Steve Jobs often called it the reality distortion field. He had this idea that he believed could happen. He didn't know how he was going to get there, but he knew he had certain tools that, that he could use to reach that. So what I would say to everybody is basically go through those steps. Think about what you think the future is going to look like. Imagine your future. Think about, okay, what do I need to do to reach that? Make a plan and go for it. These five charter articles are really important. This is what changed Japan from being a closed country to opening to the rest of the world and really shifted the future of Japan. Right now, in many ways, I feel like we're kind of in what's called the Shin Edo period, a period of Edo where people can't come, can't go, very isolated. But soon we're gonna move into the next stage after this COVID-19 into what I call the Shin or the new Meiji period. And I believe most of these five points in this charter article are relevant today and can be used today. So it'll be very interesting to see, moving forward in Japan's future, how much it embraced the power of Japan's history, the power of the emperor, together with the power of these five charter articles. Time will tell, it always does. So that was our first session for Purpose Driven Future Leaders. I hope you enjoyed the talk with Patrick and Yuichi. And I think we learned quite a lot. We learned about the history of the Meiji Shrine. We learned how Japan became a modern nation out of the Meiji Restoration. We also learned about life purpose and how to find it. We learned about technology and the role of technology. And finally, we came back here and we looked at the constitution, the first Asian constitution, which the Meiji Tenno actually uh, postulated. And that's more than 120 years ago. I wish that this is a great start, and I wish that all of us could have learned something and that we actually transfer awareness into action, because that's what we need to create the future. And the purpose-driven innovation ecosystem, we create the future. Thank you.